Uh, the book does a lot of different things, but uh, what I've tried to do is basically set the kind of, okay, I'll say this. I mean, I'll, I'll talk differently than I would at, at a non-seminary um, event, because this is seminary and seminary crowd. So like, I've made certain choices, certain choices that um, like probably other faculty of the school have not made, but I've made the choice of like, I am, I, I'm doing my work within the bounds of Christian orthodoxy broadly conceived. So like, I'm an orthodox Christian theologian. So I affirm the Trinity, I affirm the humanity and divinity of Christ, um, I affirm the inspiration of scripture, like things like that, I will affirm those things. Now, you know, other people will disagree with me on this point or that point, even regarding that, and that's totally fine. Like every, I think every theologian, every theological student, every seminary student has absolutely has the ability and the right to say, like, oh, I'm not a Trinitarian. Well, that's you know, fair enough. But you're not an Orthodox Christian theologian if you're not a Trinitarian. It doesn't mean you don't get to do Christian theology or whatever, but you're just not in that same. You know, just here. And, and, I mean, you, you are officially, like, small age a heretic, <laughs> historically speaking, if you, if you reject the Trinity. Like, that's, that's fine. Like, that, that doesn't... You're in good company. Yeah, exactly. You're in good company. And um, I've also made the choice, like, I've, I decided, I've decided in my career, at least to this point in my theological career, I am going to deal with the biblical text. The whole biblical text. I'm not going to say, like, I was teaching class here, a seminar, a reading seminar on the atonement at this school, and the students in that class were thanked in the acknowledgments from the back because they were very helpful. They read a very, as Anne Lamont would say, a very shitty first draft of this book. <laughs> um, I think that may, I don't know which draft you got. I think you got a more polished draft. It was a, yeah, more, more clo closer to this event, finished product. But they read a shitty first draft in a seminar that took place a year ago in the, in the spring of 2014. And about halfway through this class, one of the students basically stopped and said, why do you keep quoting Paul? Because our New Testament professor here said, Paul was wrong about all this stuff, and Paul was just a Jew. And like I'm sitting there going, like Paul's the first Christian theologian, and Paul invented the atonement invented atonement theory, as, as far as Christian theologians understand. And, you know, I'm like, well, that's not something someone would ask me at Fuller Seminary, where I also teach. <laughs> like, why do you keep quoting Paul? And they'd be like, why don't you quote Paul more? Um, and so, like, for sure Paul makes me uncomfortable as a progressive Protestant. But I've just simply made the choice, I'm going to deal with Paul. I'm not going to ignore Paul, I'm not a Marcionite, I'm not going to just focus on the Gospels, because that's the part of the Bible I like, but I'm also going to deal with the parts I don't like. So, kind of final prolegomena statement. Similarly, I take the Hebrew Scripture very seriously in this book, because for, for Paul, it was extraordinarily important for his understanding of the death and resurrection of Christ. And even in the Gospels, Jesus is constantly quoting Hebrew Scripture. So it's very, it's a very important bridge for them, for both Jesus and Paul, or for the Gospel writers and Paul, I would say. And it, it's similarly important for me. I have a lot of friends who are supersessionists, in that they talk about the Old Testament as it's kind of this primitive God this primitive tribal people and their conception of this tr primitive tribal Yahweh. But that's not really the God of Jesus. That's not the Abba that Jesus talked about. Well, I mean, <coughs> this, is, this is like what, this is why Marcion was deemed a heretic in the early church. Like, he was doing the same thing. So I, this is why I started meeting with my rabbi friend, a couple of you, said that you watched the live stream on the 24th of the book launch uh, from On Being, and I was introduced by this rabbi, a friend of mine, who read and reread and reread the chapters on sacrifice in the Hebrew Scripture in here, because I just really, really wanted to 
<clears throat> deal with that honestly in a, in, in a way that would not be seen as anti-Semitic. Because I think any time we're like, ah, oh, that, you know, those, that was, those, cute, those cute little Jews and their, and their cute little God who demands animals' blood be sprinkled on the altar, like, so glad we got past that. <laughs> you know, like, I didn't, I wanted to have a more pro- Jewish reading of the atonement than a lot of what I had read before. So those were some of the things I went into the book trying to do. Now, my own heresy is that I then I had to make another theological choice. So then like, what is going on in the Old Testament when God demands blood sacrifice? You can either say, I mean, what most Christians say is people either people misheard God, God never wanted that, or they say sacrifice was such a big part of that world four or five thousand years ago that God just kind of shrugged her shoulders and was like, "Fine, okay, sacrifice. Like, I'll, I'll I can live with that, I guess." As, but how about this? Sacrifice animals and not babies, like your neighbors do. Oh, okay, that's a step in the right direction. But since I wasn't going to those readings, my reading, which I think actually would be probably um, the, the, the kind of, I don't know currently, like how, in, in what regard process theology is held at this seminary, but in the past there's been kind of a strong connection between this school and Claremont and John Cobb and process theology. Yes. So in the end, I have this funny mix of this very high Christology, along with a very processy view of God. So then my final thesis in the book is that God is learning through the Hebrew scripture about how to relate to humanity. And then in the God, in the end, God makes this choice to become incarnate in the person of Jesus. And then God experiences fully um, God fully experiences Christian, I mean, uh, humanity, and that this is the key to Christianity. So, why don't I read? This isn't really, this isn't what I normally read at book readings, but I think because we're at UTS and there are like students who study with me in the, in the room here, theology professor or two, they can then argue with my conception of God. So I'll just read this one section. It's really this is the this is like this is the payoff of the book. All right. Spoiler this alert. Is it. Spoiler alert. You haven't even read this part yet. No. It's an important tenet of Christianity that God is everywhere. There's nowhere that God isn't. But our experience of God doesn't always accord with this belief. Famously, Mother Teresa preached the presence and love of God to kings and lepers her whole life, but letters published after her death told a different story. She had not sensed God's presence for decades. This is a central paradox of human existence. We attest to God's reality, but we struggle to experience God's actual presence. The experience that others had of God firsthand was overwhelming as well. For example, when Moses emerged from his encounters with the Lord on Mount Sinai or in the tent of meeting, his face shone with an otherworldly radiance. However, as often as the Israelites experience God's presence, they also experience God's hiddenness. Psalm 22 isn't the only song of lament over God's absence in the Hebrew Bible. It's one in a chorus of texts that cry out for God, long for God, and wonder aloud how long God will stay silent. All the while, we get the sense in the narrative of the Israelites that God and the people have a hard time understanding one another. God initiates a covenant, and the people struggle to keep their end of the bargain. The people beg for God to deliver them from their enemies, yet they keep getting conquered. God gives the people rafts of laws that are virtually impossible to keep, and the people debate and negotiate and legislate in their efforts to keep the laws. By a couple hundred years before Jesus, their relationship has totally broken down. God is silent, and the people are suffering under one foreign dictator or another. And then, seemingly out of nowhere, <coughs> surely at a time and place no one would have predicted, God pours, 
pardon the male pronoun for God. What? I, I know. I have a footnote apologizing for it, but I'll, I'll take my slings and arrows. God poured himself into a human being. As opposed to covenants and laws coming from on high, God recast the relationship. God came in weakness, demanding nothing with no preconditions. The Yahweh of the Hebrew Bible demanded unswerving obedience to hundreds of laws, but God in Jesus didn't even require everyone who heard him preach to convert. He didn't enjoin those he healed to pledge him fealty. He put no preconditions on his disciples. Jesus did not build himself a castle nor sit on a throne. Instead, he said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of God has nowhere to lay his head. So in Jesus, God came to earth in a posture of humility. That we know. And we also know that in Jesus, God communicated something. We learned that the meek are blessed and that the law was made for us, not vice versa. We learned that we should reach out to those on the margins. And we heard that in God's heavenly mansion there are many rooms. This all came in the direction from God to us. But, what if we reverse directions? Here's where I'm going to suggest something a bit novel. In Jesus, things were happening in the other direction as well, from us to God. In Jesus, God was learning what it is really like to be a human. In Jesus, God moved from sympathy with the human condition to empathy, and everything, and God changed as a result. Um, and then I talk a bit about um, how the Hebrew Bible attests to God changing God's mind. And then um, here's the conclusion of this chapter. In Jesus, God dove into the deep end of the pool. God became immersed in the human condition, and through the same five senses that you and I have, God took in the experience of being fully human. That means the joys, sorrows, stubbed toes, and sleepless nights that you feel, God felt. God had hangnails and smelly armpits. God felt hungry. God overate. God caught a cold. God was bitten by mosquitoes. While I'm not necessarily saying that God did not understand what it felt like to get bitten by a mosquito before Jesus, I'm saying that in Jesus, God fully experienced it. God went from sympathy to empathy with the human condition. And that changed God. For in that experience, God became passionately connected with humankind in a way that God previously was not. God, deeply embedded in Jesus of Nazareth, experienced everything that Jesus experienced, and that includes the crucifixion. And when Jesus cried out from the cross in despair and anguish, God experienced something that God had never before experienced. God experienced the absence of God. God experienced atheism. And in that moment, God had an epiphany. God understood what it's like to feel God forsaken. That's kind of the climax of the book right there. Burn. <laughs> Drop the mic. All right, so, okay, thank you. So now I'll take you on. teach you on a regular basis because <laughs> I thought that UTS needed a fresh perspective and needed to hear, hear and learn from, not about, the emerging church. I thought we were getting one of the most prominent theologians in the in emerging Christianity. What I didn't realize was that we were also getting a church historian and a systematic theologian. To describe how important I think this book is, I'll, I'll tell you a bit of my own story. I come from a background in Chinese Malaysian, that uh, Christian in Chinese Malaysian, that fully believed in the payment model of the atonement. Chinese religions or culture have often have an altar of some sort in the house or establishment. You've seen them at, at restaurants with food and incense. So while we were Christians, the idea of sacrifice permeates and is simply a given. The good news I grew up with is this. You are going to hell. <laughs> but God loves you so much he sacrificed his son for you. And um, actually my mother watched The Passion. I think it's called The Passion of the Devil. Yeah, and she was, she was one of those who's crying how much God loves us and, and, and that sort of thing. So um, Jesus rose from the dead so as to defeat the devil. Believe this and you will go to heaven. Don't believe and you will go to hell. You, you all know this. But actually I went one step further. As a young teenager, I took the story of Moses offering himself on behalf of the people. And 
actually tortured myself with this question. In, in praying for the lost, was I willing to allow God to consign me to it, eternal hell if that meant that more people would be saved? If God, if God loved me enough to sacrifice Jesus, did I love God enough to go to hell forever for other people? As I grew up, I made peace with that um, by thinking, since it says that somewhere that Jesus destroyed the gates of hell, or the gates of hell shall not prevail against Jesus, that means people can come out. The gates of hell are broken and people can come out if they want. Whoever stays there is because they want to. Then I came here, this desert of evangelicalism, where the theory of atonement was quite frequently called divine child abuse. And it was almost fashionable not to believe Jesus is God or nor did Jesus rise from the dead. So while people thought I was t teaching Christian ethics, and I was, I was also trying to convince myself that we could be saved even if Jesus were not God and did not rise from the dead. So in time, I was able to change the story to that Jesus died because he showed us about God's love and we killed him for challenging the political and religious order of the day. And the resurrection doesn't have to be real because God saves everybody anyway. Besides, it's all theory. Theology is all theory anyway. <laughs> Try telling that if you are an evangelical. <laughs> if I had said that to my mother, she would have she would really have thought that I blasphemed the Holy Spirit. And some of you know what that means. <laughs> so this is where Tony's book comes in and why it is so important. Both the traditional liberal theories and evangelical theologies have separated love and atonement. As far as the East is from the West, and never the twin shall meet. I'm not mixing my metaphors at all. Neither has been able to reconcile God's justice and God's love. Either God's justice is hollow, or God's love is hollow. So Tony addresses the different theories of atonement and offers us a bold, incredible account that brings both love and sacrifice together. Imagine an atonement theory that is about love. God self-limits, this is another spoiler, God self-limits in order to create a free, independent, independently existing and working world. God loves by self-limitation. So you com compare the idea of self-limitation to, for example, self-aggrandizement, or narcissism, or self-involvement, or selfishness, and you know what I mean. Self-limitation is the opposite of those. God, God then self-limits even more in Jesus. In, Jesus self in the Jesus self-limitation, God experiences being human, even to suffering and death. God did not sacrifice his son Jesus to appease his own wrath. God's sacrifice was Jesus, in that God's, God's self-limited to become Jesus, to experience what we, what we experience, and therefore fully understand us and be with us always. Jesus' life and death shows us that this is the nature of God, humble, self-limiting. God saves us by understanding us and being with us through it all. And in that Jesus rose from the dead, the resurrection shows us that it is possible for sin, which um, is human disease and wrongness, to be overcome because God is with us always. Did you have any questions? Did I have any questions? Mm, I'll stick with This book should be given to any of our evangelical friends. They need to read it. I also think that this book needs to be given to some of the folks who have left the church because they just can't take it anymore. And what I mean is they can't take the hypocrisy of the atonement theory of why some God, who's creator of everything, would need people to die or need anything, much less his sin's blood, much less pig blood, or anything like that. Um, what this book has shown me is. 
and I've not even read the whole thing, is that it allows me to create, uh, understand my faith and my own theological understanding, and that it's not one thing. Um, as much as we'd like it to be one thing, I was raised with it being one thing. I was raised the Sunday of God. So it was like, this is it, and this is the ultimate truth, and we have it, and we will pray for our Baptist brothers and sisters and our Catholic brothers and sisters. Well, they weren't even our brothers and sisters, Catholics, when we know that. But the Lutherans were Catholic whites, it was a little bit of that. Um, but, you know, there's something about the idea of, the, of what, one, one of the things where it's, you know, the Jewish folk, when you're talking about Jewish understanding of sin, uh, pre-New Testament, and sin was just sin. It wasn't, just, it wasn't just like what we've made out to be today, like this horrible, oh, God's crying every time you sin, you're crucified every time you masturbate. You know, it was like all the things I grew up listening to. Um, but, you know, it, it's one of these things where it's like, it's just sin. What? It's, it's just sin. It's just we're fallen human beings. We die. It's just part of life. Now, some people will say, well, that's going to give us a license to do everything or do nothing. But for me, it gives me the freedom to live, much like um, uh, Martin Luther experienced. When he first got the idea of grace, even though it might have not been the perfect idea, he was like, holy moly, I'm free. You know? And he didn't go out and like, you know, buy a bunch of satanic albums and um, he didn't drink a lot, he a lot. But, that's besides the point. The guy, did, you know, he did some questionable things, but the fact is, is that he did not take advantage of grace. I don't think it's possible to take advantage of it. And when you go, well, sin's just sin, it is another level of reaching and understanding of grace and the love of God. And it is allowance to live a life that God created. If God created everything, we don't have to have a special code or anything like that. We are constantly living in God's presence. That includes everyone in here and everyone out of here. Now, there are people who kill. There are people who do bad things. You know what? But that is a minority group of folks. And it's folks with a different kind of understanding. But that can be changed by walking in and going, you made a mistake. And mistakes are part of life. Life is fragile. And you've hurt life. And you've broken it. But you know what? You can still move on. Now, this is what this book is giving me. I'm reading this. I've been reading it for the last three days. Usually, I can read crappy books fast, so it's a good thing that I didn't read this fast. I mean, almost the whole thing's highlighted. Um, the framework I think Paul was working within, and I, this is the part where I'm curious, is I, I, part of, I'm a Paulinian guy. I love Paul. I'm like the guy who's like, I'm going to make everybody love Paul again. Pastoral epistles, forgeries, let's just get rid of them. Paul's cool. But what we have to remember is Paul is working within a very particular framework. He was a Pharisee. And so what I'm seeing in, in, in Tony's book is a lot of people are using their theology within their own framework. And so with Paul, do we have to go, you know, because Paul's very big. Jesus died on the cross for our death, and that's the only way. And it's all about atonement and things like that. But for him, that's the sense he could make out of it because his whole life had been sacrificing animals and other things like that. And he was like, well, for a, a Messiah to die, for God to die on the cross is like a joke, you know? I know I'm preaching in the choir here, but you know, what is the first, like graffiti was like making fun of a crucified God, mm -hmm. you know? And, and it was a mockery. So in his mind, he goes, oh, wait a second. Like any theologian, so I mean, those guys would argue over one word. Not much like, I mean, we do too, but they would, one word in, the, in, in a sentence, and they would argue for days about it. So here Paul is going, holy crap, final, this is it. He paid the price. He did it. And what's wrong with that? What's wrong with Paul believing it? Well, here's the problem, is that we force that everyone accepts his theology. Now, Paul is the first to tell you not to do that, because he says he's no respecter of man. And God has no respect for me. Remember when he goes to meet with the disciples? He goes, I don't really care what they had to say. God has no favorites. Paul wants you to be able to disagree with him. That is the coolest part about Paul. Um, he's also kind of passive aggressive, so I think he might be Minnesota. That yeah. whole thing he writes about, <laughs> to about the. Uh, anyway, that's another story. So, grace shines through 
and, and, and maybe it's not a they, death isn't it, but grace is real. And what Paul does is it allows us to see grace. Um, maybe his lens is through just atonement, but I'm able to experience Christ as living because Paul grasped into something. Now, my belief is that Jesus did not die for our sins. It's a little bit different than yours, right? I believe Jesus came to show us that we were never separated from God. And I believe when the curtain rips down and there's nothing behind it, that was the idea is you guys have separated yourselves from me. On your own, on your own behalf. I've always been here. I'm going to come and show you my true nature. Um, you know, the thing you said is, is about the gospel is the gospel is where you can make it. Um, and what, for a lot of theology, the gospel is, is, is what you can make of it. And one thing I really like is that I like God more. Halfway through your book, God is not an invisible cloud of terror or strangeness or even a man in the sky. Whatever it is, even if it's like Tillich's ground of all beings, which sounds like almost nothing, I know that it's something that I grasp more and I care more about. I like to compliment people. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, so that's, those are my things. Um, what is it? This guy named Ant, is it Anselm? Anselm. Anselm. I do not like him. <laughs> he really disturbed me. That guy's a bad character. I don't like him in this book. And now I want to read some of his stuff because it really makes me mad. But I like how you put in where he, where he comes from. He's new to me. He made it all up. He made that thing really up. I know. Let's get a time machine so we can do this. Um, there's one more thing I want to say about your book, and I'll get close. Um, I like the idea of understanding that, and I've understood this before, but it just really nailed it down, is that our idea of God has become such the idea of a medieval king. You know? And uh, have you ever been in medieval times? <laughs> I mean, that's our concept. Behead him! Get rid of him! You know? And, and then we think, and then we go, well, we're all being judged. But then we think of our court system like it is now. We don't realize that the court system we're talking about is a medieval king. He's like, make me laugh or I'm going to cut your head off. So we've got issues there. Um, and it's amazing because lately with this Indiana stuff, the conversations <laughs> I've been having, which has caused me to actually recommend this book to quite a few people, is how the people have such a limited understanding of the gospel, have grasped such an American idea of what atonement is and why Jesus died and all this stuff that they don't shake and they don't move and God is a monster. And you can tell them, God is a monster. Isn't it God who would force someone not to love them, to burn them forever? Isn't that a monster? And what they say is like, how dare you? That's a loving God. It's up to you. And I'm like, well, what about the people in other countries who have no choice? Oh, God will make himself known every day. I'm like, they, they have become so corrupt that they can't realize that love is not what Hitler did. Now, why did you say Hitler did? Well, because Hitler put people in ovens and burned them and killed them. But what Hitler did was more compassionate than what we're saying God is going to do. Right? Eternity, burning things. So these people are so stuck in this framework that if they could see the importance and the idea of theology, that we have a freedom to disagree with these folks, a freedom to realize that sin is just sin. Let's take its power, take, completely takes its power away. Um, I think it's a beautiful thing. I love it, and uh, I hope more people read it. Now, I do have a question for you. Um, two, actually. One is, you know, Brian McLaren's book, and I'm a kind of Christian, and he talks about seeing the Old Testament through Christ's eyes, and, um, and also not being a, uh, uh, it's not a constitution. It's not a constitution, right? Right. Yeah. The other says seeing it through Christ's eyes. Now, I'm wondering, I felt like there was a little bit of what you said earlier that might disagree. Yeah, with. I mean, I think I would say in my book, as opposed to what Brian has said about that, I try to see the Hebrew Bible through the eyes of the Hebrew Bible. Like, I'm trying to take it 
on its own merits and on its own terms. I'm sure that I don't do that perfectly because as a Christian, I, you know, of course I'm interpreting it through my own eyes, right? Through yeah. my own perspective. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, mm -hmm. I'm trying to read it on its own terms and not superimpose. Like, I, like probably a lot of us growing up, I was taught to read the Old Testament. You know, I even, when I was in Campus Crusade College, they made me get this Bible called the Open Bible. <laughs> and then like the preface to every book of the Old Testament, it says like, where's Christ in this book? And you know, I look back now and I'm like, where are they gonna find Christ in Esther? Like God is <laughs> in Esther, how can they find Christ in Esther? But they found Christ in every book. Like Christ foretold in every book. So I'm trying to disabuse myself of that and just take, take it on its own terms. And the idea that you have said that humanity is, 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 has caused, caused those folks to turn on Christ, what it said, it was just human nature. Mm -hmm. I found it to be brilliant, and I found it to be like something that I hate to always want to do, but I'm not really trying to, but I think it really takes chains off people's hands if they can grasp it. It takes the legalistic, religious, man-made crap, and they go, no, it wasn't sin, it wasn't some great devil power, it wasn't God that was orchestrating this horrible mess. It was the fact that they were humans, and there was a mob, and we know that mob mentalities exist today. Yeah. And I thought that was beautiful. And one more thing, and I'm going to ask you a question about this. We should let, we can let Jack go. And then... But the runaway train, that's the only thing I want to ask. Just, that's it, we're done. The runaway train of sin. Original sin. Can you just? Well, yeah. In short, yeah. what I, the argument I make in the book is that original sin basically was Augustine's reading of the Genesis account, and then, and then like that train, once that train left the station and started down the hill, like uh, it keeps getting added to along the years. Like Calvin adds to it, and then Jonathan Edwards, and like you know. To, these days, there are like these hyper Calvinists. So every like the train gaining speed, that original sin train. But you also find out when you study church history is that like the Eastern Orthodox never accepted Augustine as a great theologian, and never accepted original sin as a doctrine. So they their whole conception of salvation is different because they don't even have the same start from the same start. So I guess something you talked about um, early on in the book was this conception of the youth minister using um, the new pastor actually using a <coughs> graphic and detailed story of the crucifixion to to be like a catalyst in kids' lives. And um, first of all, I just want to say I'm glad you named that and talked about it, put your finger on it, because that is I think an abuse use of the story, and I'm glad you know what it is. Um, but I also liked, um, in, in the book and in the discussion on the 24th, you uh, described the story of being at a church and having all the kids in the space turn to their adult about them and ask them, in what way, like by what actual mechanism does Jesus' death like, atone for you? And like the fact that people think to do it. I mean, I, I like the, the setup you do out of it. Um, and I'm glad you put it in there because I think people start just knowing it's idiot. the train metaphor might apply here, but the idea of like, I know I'm supposed to believe this and I keep believing it, and there's almost a sense of magic behind it without, without parsing it out or without really analyzing why you would have to speak in the first place. Um, yeah. The thing, the thing I found, um, I guess, the most profound, because people have, some theologians have kind of touched on the topic of God's ability to change. And I think it's still a scandalous idea to so many, especially conservative evangelicals. But having you to read that section you read um, really like pins down like that is. That is your novel idea. That is what you're kind of bringing as new. And I guess my question for you would be: Is is that point the point you get in the most 
resistance about on or pushback from? Like, I'm really curious, like, my main question is, is about response. I know you read responses and engage with your responses. So I'm curious, like, what, what aspect of the book people kind of are pushing back against most? If it's like, if it's kind of undo, undoing the payment model, the old substitutionary model, or if it's like this idea that God learns. And the guy changes. I mean, I know there's been process theology for a while, so some camps are very comfortable with that idea, but some are so uncomfortable with it. So, yeah, I more comments about it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I'm, it's, it's really early, so it's hard for me to gauge. Like, there have been no scholarly reviews of them. You know, I'd be fa I'm, I'm really, I'm crossing my fingers that you know it'll be reviewed by one or both of Christianity Today and Christian Century, because that would be like the kind of the popular level kind of flagship magazines of, of evangelicalism and mainline Christianity. Um, I think that I think that I mean, so I've not really heard a lot yet of like. Criticism. You know, the first couple of weeks, usually, unless you're Rob Bell, it's a lot of people like throwing bouquets at you and saying, like, oh, this is a great book, way to go, because your kind of fan base buys it. And then as it, as it kind of trickles out, um, you know, I mean, the, the people like the negative reviews I've gotten on Amazon so far, not people who like people who just hate me personally. They're, it has, they're not people who read the book. So it's tough to even gauge that kind of thing. There have been, not, nobody's even blocked about it negatively. So I'm going to guess that. Um, uh, people who are more progressive are going to struggle with my very high Christology. And people who are more conservative are going to struggle with this processy view of God, this idea that God would change. But the, the book doesn't really hinge on my own theory. What the more conservative people are going to be frustrated with simply is that I relativize the payment view of the atonement and say it's not the only way to understand it. And that, um, and, you know, for a lot of people, like, that version of the atonement is the gospel. If, if God isn't, like, if Jesus isn't saving us from God's wrath and, like, making this blood payment that God requires, then kind of like, well, what's the point, right? Like, what's the What's the point of any of it? Um, God's a bloodthirsty deity, and somebody needs to pay in blood, and it's only the perfect God man can do it, so it's Jesus. So I think um, it w uh, I think it'll be very interesting to see what the response is of the book. I mean, probably most evangelicals would just ignore it. Sadly. But I think that's why the you know, people live in their little silos and stuff. So, yeah, I'll, I'll be interested. Well, I just think it's interesting. I, I come to the book as a Unitarian Universalist, and I recognize that, like, the atonement that I fought against is still the atonement that is in my head. You know, oh, it's like, yeah. So when I'm reading a, a book that's challenging this yeah. old view of the atonement I used to have, even though I don't have it anymore, I still felt a little bit protective of it. But then also, like, when I step back from that, I'm still thinking to myself, like, I'm really grateful that you're helping to create a new model, because I think so many people who, like you said, have given up from the church, whether it's all church or just the Christian church and now yeah. the yeah. you know, like, they're still revolting against an old model that is kind of crazy. Like, yeah. part of me still does, like, you asked the question in the book, like, would God demand a payment we can't afford? And that question is, I mean, a phenomenal question that is not only uh, relevant to most Christians, but there's a lot of personal aspect to it too. Mm -hmm. Like for me personally, coming out as a gay person and then like leaving the church because of it, like my phrasing of that question is about my sexuality, you know, because I was told one view of atonement, one view of sexuality, and like my my question as a person was like, would God demand this of me when I can't do it? You right. know, like yeah. So this is yeah. all like wrapped up together yeah, sure. in this way of like recasting old models. So mm -hmm. yeah, I just and, the, and then also that you make it pretty clear that you are a theologian who does not purport like you you basically claim that theology shouldn't be conclusive, but it should be ongoing and dynamic. Mm -hmm. And you said that very 
like, I don't know what the page number is. Very right? beginning, very beginning. Yeah, yeah. and it's, that's something that, again, I hope more people will hear and sit with, so. Oh, and another thing, you, you had like six questions that you asked of each model. Yeah. And I don't remember all six now, but I know the one that stuck with me the most was where is the love? Like in this model of the crucifixion of hell, the atonement, like where is the love? If it doesn't, if it doesn't well describe or reveal God's love for humanity, then maybe it's not the best model. Yeah. So yeah, that was like one way to make it a little bit of time left. I'd like to open it up to anyone who has a question to ask. I have a lot of questions for Jay Baker, but they can, if not, I have a good question. Okay, so. Um, no, come on, no questions? questions? Yeah. Well, go ahead. Yeah, I have some, but I won't. All right. Um, so. Well, seeing as we're at a seminary, and you know, a, lot of, a lot of our students are going into the same mainline denomination that seem to uphold or at least not let go of. Mm -hmm. um, some of these theories. What is there a particular hope, or, or is there a particular takeaway you hope pastors will take from this book when they go into it? Yeah, book? for sure. I, I mean, I really think, I really think that like one of the main problems of mainline Christianity is just like we've gone soft on almost everything, and. It's like the choices, just the, in, in the pot. Now, not in a theo, not not at a theological institution like this, where a lot of people have like very thoughtful, nuanced views of these things, right? But I, but when I, um, like, just at the popular level, it's like when people go out to churches, it's like they either have a choice of churches where people are like splashing in Jesus' blood; they're so happy that there's blood dripping mm -hmm. from the cross, or on the other hand, you've got mainline churches that are like, will never talk about the crucifixion. They just wish it had never happened. God, I wish God would have saved us some other way than an execution. Or the most they can say is like, this is about, a, this is about an empire that killed a revolutionary peasant. That's the story. And I'm like, oh my God, you know how many peasants have been killed by revolutionary, or like revolutionary peasants by empires? Like Spartacus would be a better savior for us than Jesus, because way more people like went to death with Spartacus in the in the you know the slave war against the Roman Empire than G than the few dozen people Jesus had. Like this is an this is an event in the Godhead. That's what makes it important. So what I would like at a, at a school like this is for is for students who are being prepared for ministry to at least consider that. Because I get it, like there are UUA students here, whatever, and there, there are people at this school, and there was even somebody last night, I was at Colonial Church, which is pretty kind of centrist to kind of evangelical church, and at the end, someone's like, why do we even need atonement? <laughs> well, you don't if you don't read Paul, you don't if you don't think there's sin, you don't if you, you know, that, like these kind of metaphysical questions that theology is always <coughs> consumed with, that's why atonement is important. So that's I, I just hope that progressive mainline clergy and seminary students would think like, can I preach the cross? Like, what do I do with all this blood and violence? I don't want to do what the conservatives do with it, but like, is it redeemable? Is there a way for me to preach it? See now the option. Uh, so I went to the page where you give the answer. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I think you say. Can I say spoiler? I mean, spoiler. Yeah, yeah. Right. Did God kill Jesus? The answer is no. But you also distinguish your view. I think I haven't read it yet, but somewhere I saw from nonviolent atonement theory, Denny Weaver. I think right around that same. Yes, yeah, right. That's right. So how do you? differentiate your perspective from the kind of dominant nonviolent theory. Right, so. right. So this is like this is a this is a thing I like I've gone round and round with Brian my friend Brian McLaren on this, who graciously endorsed the book, 
but also wrote me in the email after he sent the endorsement to the publisher, like a list of 10 bullet points of things he didn't like about the book, <laughs> which is what friends do, right? Because he's calling for a nonviolent atonement. Like he uses that phrase a lot, even in his newest book, We Make Through by Walking. It's, a, it's like a Girardian lectionary, Girardian McLaren lectionary. That's all about non, the nonviolent atonement. And I'm just like, look, it was violent. So stop calling it nonviolent. He was crucified, like beaten, senseless, and crucified. He was humiliating, he was torturous, it was violent. Oh, but it, didn't, his, but it didn't need to be violent. Then why was it violent? That's the theological question that I'm interested in. You can be like, well, God, I mean, this is one of the theological questions, right? That, that you start asking your youth pastor when you're in high school. But did it have to be by crucifixion? And your youth pastor had one of two answers. Like, yes, that was the only way that God could have saved the world was by crucifying this one person at this one time by this method. Or the answer was, no, it didn't have to be this way, but God chose it. And then, then you go down this other stream, which is my, for my stream, and then they're like, then why? Then why would God choose this? Why would it be violent? And I think that that, that Girardian nonviolent camp has some really good answers, but I'm also very troubled <coughs> by what I consider this, his anti-Semitic reading of the Hebrew Bible. So Brian and I have kind of, you know, had, had some friction over that, uh, a good nature, or whatever. So I guess for me, uh, to say it's a nonviolent atonement is kind of skirting the issue. I think it's a bit of a semantic game to say, oh, I believe in a nonviolent atonement. Well, what do you do with that dead guy on the cross then? Like, it was a violent act that is the atoning act. At the center, at the center of the Christian faith. So that's why I, put, that's where I'm pushing back against those guys a little bit. So they don't like that so much. Yeah. I mean, for sure. Another way to ask the question of the, that is your title mm -hmm. is, did God intend intend the death of Jesus? Did God intend the cross? So another question would be related to this, I think. I mean, <coughs> Moltmann's not a process theologian, right? No, right. And so are you closer to Moltmann on that or to process theism in the sense that, you know, for Moltmann, the cross was intended, even if it's not a substitutionary you know, model in the same way uh, because of the Trinitarian. I would say that one of my, probably one of the places that I'm most open to critique on this book is the, um, all the Pauline writing about the purpose of God and the plan of God in the death of Jesus. So that this was all part of God's plan. And if you go more processy, you have more of a problem with those kind of Pauline phrases, where Paul seems to talk about God as this being outside of time, who is like, oh, this is going to happen, then this, then this, then this. It's all in my plan. And I'm backing away from that a little bit. And so I probably would lean more process than more on, on that aspect, I'm guessing. But what I'll say is that it's like one of the, what Jack's referring to, these six questions, like one uh, that I pose to every version of the atonement, all the major versions of the atonement. Um, it's like God and Jesus have to be united in purpose. So I'm, I'm okay talking about the purposes of God. I'm, I'm, and they're like, I think Moltmann and I would agree, but, I, but I'm, um, I'm reluctant to talk about kind of the plan of God as though God's outside of time and has this, has like all these dominoes and flicks the first one and boom, 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 they all start to fall. I'm more, because Moltmann's ambivalent about this too, because he, like I steal this idea of, Sharon talked about at the end of her response, the self-limitation or zimsum of, of that Mo, I take directly from Oman, he took directly from Jewish Kabbalah. And so this idea that God has retreated and withdrawn enough to give creation its own agency, um, you know, that, that's where I get all that start on this path of God's self-limitation. 
I just probably take up God's self-limitation one step further than Momar to say that God, part of that sim song is that God even bound God's self to time and is experiencing time with us, which I don't think Momar would have found. So. Okay, were there any other questions? Oh, life is full. Thank you all very much for coming. We have Tony's book for sale. Thank you all Thanks, for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.